Aw, out. Murphy's Jaw. Murphy's Jaw. Murphy's Jaw. Murphy's Jaw. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. I guess we could just jump right into it, Mike. Man, I'm, you know what? I, I have to say, just straight off the bat, I am, I'm bummed out. Well, I'm bummed out. You know, we I, we kind of warned everybody, kind of, but you can't really know where you're at until you watch it. Um, the diminishing returns are striking. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> welcome back to the show, everybody. Yeah, welcome back, welcome to, back to Murphy's Jaw. Episode two of Murphy's Jaw. I'm Jake. And uh, I'm Mike Sains. As always, is uh, Mr. Mike Sains. And for all you OCP employees out there, for all you old Detroit uh, citizens and future Delta City citizens. Yeah. We appreciate you tuning in. And uh, we are representing both the corporation and the people today. You should know. Oh yeah. For, for visual purposes, we'll have I to, am in a three piece. We'll have suit to like right post now. a photo or something this when the true. episode drops to you cuz yeah, I we we had mentioned last episode uh Mike um if you guys didn't know uh is a man of high fashion. I'm into clothes. I like yeah, clothes. Yeah, and he, and he's got he's got a great sense for for fashion and clothes and stuff. And so um we had like jokingly said, I think it was on the episode. I, I think we said it when we were still recording that uh, you should dress up as like an OCP employee because like, like we were mental, watching the mental fir- note. Yeah, we were watching the first one. and We were like, dude, most of these people look like Mike Sane's <laughs> Instagram photos. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yeah, true to form, you come out of the car like RoboCop. Door opens there, <laughs> dun, dun. and you're like OCP uh, reporting for duty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we ready to do this OmniCorp meeting or yeah, what, guys? That's right. That's right. Um, so no, that was that was that was a treat. So luckily, I mean, not luckily. Unfortunately, you can't see it, but luckily, we'll we'll try to remember. We'll to post put some something pictures up. online yeah. for sure. I got to find my RoboCop helmet. Um, unfortunately, it's all, it's from the uh, remake, but it's still a RoboCop helmet. So. Yeah, shout out to Joel Kinnaman, who's like I constantly coming up now. I just watched Art Altered Carbon. I was like, Did you watch the whole thing? The whole uh, I've watched the first two and a half episodes. Yeah, and how many episodes is it? I mean, it's Netflix, so I'm gonna say ten. Ten. Okay, yeah. that's a, that's a solid number. Yeah. Thirteen's a little too much for me. Like with the Marvel stuff, like yeah. And aside from maybe the first season of Daredevil, I could do without yeah. thirteen episodes of Marvel yeah. ever again. Yeah, for sure. And uh, it's you know, it was like a weird kind of prep for this because it's still sci-fi a little bit of cyberpunk no, no. i mean but, again he is a r- alumni of robocop yeah i could and it's all in the jaw it's all in the chin mm-hmm. i could see it and sure. i like joel kinnaman yeah I, strong, I like him a lot um, strong physical performer um the the you know the first thing i really remember uh focusing on with him was the killing yeah and i love yeah. that show he's like oh he's like a legitimate actor he's great in the killing yeah he, he, kills he that is show. so freaking great on that show that whole show i was so glad that it came back on netflix to kind of have a closure to it yeah because that, that's a show i need to rewatch. i i really fell in love one with of the show best hard. pilot episodes of anything i've ever seen sure yeah. yeah and there's some episodes in there uh especially during season three that are truly disturbing <laughs> and we are going to bring down this discussion of prestige television <laughs> with uh what could <laughs> have been a four episode television show in yeah, the 90s if, if that uh yeah of course this is episode two like we said in murphy's jaw it's a podcast all about robocop and uh, this week, or this uh, this month, excuse me, is 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 all RoboCop two. Um, so you know, here comes the sequel to a uh, you know the first RoboCop nineteen eighty seven. Right, it's a big deal, B- great film, huge statement film, a bit of yes. a, like an art, an art coup, mm-hmm. an uh, action film directed by this like eccentric European yeah. guy. So how do you follow that up with a sequel? Well, you get um, 1990s RoboCop 2. Uh, now, granted, there's a lot of kind of backstory to this. Um, the, the biggest thing being uh, Frank Miller at the time. Comic on, books Frank Miller. Comic books Frank Miller. Dark Knight Returns Frank Miller comes on to, to basically write the thing. Um, and if we ever get to the point where we do a, uh, like a RoboCop comics podcast, I'll go more in depth about the, the Frank Miller stuff because he does more than just RoboCop 2. Mm-hmm. And granted, there is he, no, he does uh, with Walt Simonson, he does Terminator vs. RoboCop or RoboCop vs. Terminator. Wherein he kills Skynet. He does, yeah, I mean, he does, um, uh, you know, there's one shots, there's other comics of it. So there, And then they took his original script for RoboCop 2, made it into, an, I think, a nine-part comic, and they took his original script for RoboCop 3 and made it RoboCop Last Stand. Mm. Um, so, yeah, he comes on to write uh, a script that is deemed unfilmable. And for, for the RoboCop franchise, I mean, you already had the boardroom scene. You mm-hmm. already had Murphy's execution. That These were our, our moments you could argue. I think this might have. Okay, no, we're good. Yeah, we got okay. like Frank Miller <laughs> coming in and raising the stakes of the unfilmableness of his script. 
Yeah. Which, it, like, we, while we were watching the movie, you were sitting there watch or following along with a Frank Miller companion. Yeah, piece? I had, I have, um, I have the like comp- complete Frank Miller on my um on Comicsology, and I also have it uh, uh, RoboCop two and three like in a uh, you know trade paperback or whatever. And I was uh, trying to keep somewhat along with the the movie and the comic, which is a hard thing to do because. There's sim- sim- similar elements of it, like the idea of a RoboCop 2, uh, RoboCop getting his uh, mind kind of fucked with by OCP and going <laughs> insane. Um, but there's also some huge differences. And uh, one of the things is I, I could see where they get the unfilmable because it is, and this is going to sound insane for RoboCop, it is violent and crazy as fuck. Yeah, and I so like the the when we were watching the film, the one thing that I noticed uh, was the difference in the relationship between RoboCop, or rather Murphy and Lewis, and Lewis's involvement in the second RoboCop? Wherein, like in the film, she's around for maybe fifteen total minutes. If that, yeah, maybe. I mean, she's around as about as long as his family is. And man, you were not kidding about whiffing on the family stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, let's dive into that. Because, yeah, like, like I said, we we'll have to take this in in each episode of the the, mm-hmm. the TV show. It would have yeah. been. We'll 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 you know I'm a huge Frank Miller fan. We'll dive more into Frank Miller in, in the comic issue and stuff, and, and talk more about because he, like I said, he does more than just uh, RoboCop two and RoboCop three in terms of script. He still gets a story by and a screenplay credit. Yeah, on screen for, for this. and he does get a fairly good death in the film. He does, yeah, even he's, though he's not credited as a screen. Yeah, actor. Uh, he is. He is in the film as well as a scientist uh, named they call Frank. Him Frank. I believe. Yeah. So um, anyway, so I mentioned last episode. How one of the problems I have with RoboCop two is his is that they introduce some interesting ideas. Mm-hmm. One of them being okay, the first film kind of it makes a conscious effort to not deal with the family. Really, it has that one beautiful scene where everything great about RoboCop is in basically one is shown. It shines bright in it's, one scene where he goes back to his house. Motivation. Yeah, and so you get the music, you get the you know, you get the acting, you get the 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 outfit, you get the setting, you get everything works so well in that one scene. In this one little raw moment. Yeah, and and it, that's all we need for the family. That's fine, perfect. But in the second one, they decide to um, bring up the idea where uh, his family's still around. His son is in still around. In the city. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Just like in Detroit proper. Yeah, yeah. His wife and kid are still around, and he. Is basically they introduce that idea again. So I remember the first time watching this, being like, "Oh yeah, like this is going to be a whole big touching thing about talking to his son again." There are so and... many existential like when I'm I really have to break this down. Yeah, There's like it. three sides of this. You have the son realizing that my father is still around. There's got that poor child. Yeah. The wife who's like, this is the shell of the husband that I used to love, who is now just owned by the corporation and is a piece of meat. And then on. RoboCop side and Murphy's side he's like he totally does know who his wife is and is forced to constantly lie to her I don't know who you are go away well they also they make the point too where like one of the OCP guys is like you need to stop going by your house like every day you are like, it's not mentally just, like, destroying it's not her. like the, the one time we see it on film is the one time it happens right it's it, like this has been going on potentially since the end of the first the RoboCop the first I didn't even think of it like that. Like maybe RoboCop's got like a, a restraining order against him. He's like stalking her. He's like, "Look, Murphy, we have lawyers that are telling us you can't keep doing this." Yeah, and then his little, his I little, love her. His little vision that you know is like his HUD pops up, and it's like restraining order. Keep you know, if you, uh, he's ignoring a direct. Well, no, 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 no. What happens is it's like you have one foot to comply. You know what I mean? Like he is exactly he exactly the limits of his. He's ex- yeah, he would order. know. His HUD would tell him. Um, oh, this got sad. See, yeah. This, and could this, if these things existed in the film, I'm like, wow, this is fascinating. This is like a psychological struggle between a man who is kind of a machine and like his overlords. We don't get a fucking hint of that. No. Not even a little bit of it. He's just sitting outside the house. Yeah. And they're like, bad RoboCop. Yeah. It's it's kind of insane. Um, and that's it. Then they just put her in a cop car and they just whisk her away. They're like, anyway, what's up with that Kane guy? They, I, I had talked to you in the last last episode. I'm like, Mike, for real? Like, they introduce the wife, and then they literally just push her in a car, and that's it. They do. And they, I, 
it, in the first film, even though there's that one, it's like a Frank Castle loop where all he sees is this one little mental image mm-hmm. and it's like just enough to fuel him. They instead in this movie, it's like I was saying when we were watching the screening together, it's like in the first RoboCop movie, everything is suggested and it's like a setup punchline kind of in your face comedy. If you know what you're looking for, like Paul Verhoeven is subverting all these things mm-hmm. in this movie. Irvin Kershner was just like, what if we talk about all of the subtext? Yeah. What if we point out all of the text? There's no subtext. It is just text. That's a Jason Manzoukas quote. <laughs> but- and real quick, like you mentioned, Irvin Kershner is director of this film. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not Paul, Paul Verhoeven. The director of the, 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 the- Of The Empire Strikes Back. One of the greatest sequels ever. Now, granted, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put the blame on him entirely because one of the things I wanted to mention is I have a, I got a book which is like the greatest book of all time. We it's have called, research in front of us. It's people. called RoboCop: The Definitive History by uh, Callum uh, Waddle, I believe is how you pronounce pronounce the name here. But this has been like my Bible. One just as a RoboCop fan, it's awesome. Great behind the scenes pictures, uh, great storyboard, concept beats, art, concept art. Um, and they go deep. I mean, it's not just the films. Uh-huh. The shot of Lewis who oh, gets yeah. so, I mean, just so hardly but they, underutilized. They, they go not just, they go to the toys. They do go into the comics. They go into the animated series like Alpha, Alpha Commando, which most people don't think realize and they think of the other show as just the only one. Um, and then, of course, the, the reboot. Um, but anyway, so this has been kind of like our guide because I was hoping it would get here in time for the first film, but it didn't. So it's been a kind of a help. Um, for us with the second film. It's something that we're going to be leaning heavily on. So shout out to the RoboCop, The Definitive History by, by Callum Model because it's going to be a big help for it, us. It needs to help us fill in the gaps because yeah. there there were pieces in that film. Had I not have known Irvin Kershner did not get along with Lewis in real life. Yeah, that was something I found out from the book. I like, would have been wondering where the hell is this woman who played like a central role in the first film? Mm-hmm. I mean, like he's... Lewis, by all effects, should be like RoboCop's April O'Neil, and has a huge role in the in the Miller script, like the original Miller script, and, yeah. the, and in the comic you see in as the well. Comic yeah. they physically kiss. Like, yeah, they do. They embrace. That's, right. That's something we talked about. Like in the movies, we love that. Like it never became that in in the in the Miller uh, script. Yeah, they they kiss, and then he kind of walks away like the like the uh, lone gunman in a western. He walks off into the sunset. You know, <laughs> Shane to die on yeah, his yeah, horse. Exactly. Um, but yeah, anyway, Irvin Kershaw is kind of thrown into the movie at the last second. Yeah, and there's a lot of, I mean, and you can tell because, again, the film, it's really important to stress. It is very distinctly chopped up into four very distinct parts of the story that all felt like they should have been their own standalone thing. You have your reintroduction of the world of Detroit uh, and, like, the craziness happening there and, like, the, the tone of the news and the corporate world and all that stuff. Then you have, like, RoboCop and his family... And then there's the Kane guy who <laughs> takes over the second half of the film. But every one of these characters sort of just float around the edges until it's their time to get in on the arc. Yeah. Also, like the beginning of this movie is kind of like, um, hey, here's the uh, the kind of satire news talking heads. And, and then man. we never do it again. They don't, they don't really do it again, do they? And not only that. Because they... it's like that's that's what you expect from RoboCop. Right. Here it is in the beginning. Right. It's very funny. Mm-hmm. Boom. And then none of that. And even the difference in the satire, like as a comedy fan in the first one, they make like really macabre violence and terrorism a joke. Whereas in the second one, it's much more like uh, a fatal car anti-theft device where you shock a guy to death and then mm-hmm. you just drive away. Isn't that funny? Yeah. It's almost like they're playing the comedy as straight as they're playing the drama. So the Verhoeven absurdity is kind of lost. Like, yeah, uh, it almost makes it like more capitalist in that it's like, but did you understand the satire of this though? It doesn't seem like you did. No. Uh, and that's, I mean, for a filmmaker to miss it, that's, that's even more perplexing. And that's, a, I think it's a direct result or, um, a factor to the diminishing returns. Like again, every point of this film, they feel as though they have to talk out everything. Yeah. And a lot of it flounders. A lot of it misses the mark hard. Well, okay. Like we were saying, uh, so much, there's some interesting ideas brought up and then they kind of vanish. So we talked about the family being introduced and it's like maybe five, six minutes of it. And then it's kind of, we get it, boom, gone, 
push her, shove, shove her in a car. And it was more away. about like denying his humanity, like the corporate board, like you're not a man, you're a machine, mm-hmm. and this this whole back and forth. But it's just like one of those things where like you watch enough movies and you're like, that will pay off. Right. <laughs> Clearly they're doing this because it's going to pay off. Like she'll come to her husband's aid at the end of the movie to help defeat Kane or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Or he'll, that. you know, you know, he'll see his kid again or something. You know, I'm I'm such a sucker he for like the He never sees yeah. that boy again. No, I'm, I'm and I'm I'm a huge sucker for like the father-son stuff, you know, like just in movies. And like that's something I've said it a million times already, but like with that the freaking the the reboot like that's something that they hammer on and i think is effective in the movie granted i'm not saying that the first movie needed that because they made a conscious choice we're not doing that here's what we're here's but, how we're dealing with but it but in a the film second, that plays it straight and the second movie even in the beginning with the the kid mobster guy little foot from yeah. land before time when he shoots robocop in the head because robocop can't shoot a kid you know it's part of you know you know you're not going to shoot a kid um it he has a flash of his son mm-hmm and then he sees his son on the bike go into his, you know, and then, the, you know, the wifey, like you were saying, even kind of looks at him as like, is that, oh, Jesus, is that Robocop? You know, <laughs> like, is that that creep up? <laughs> um, but like, I don't know, man, like th- that always bugged me because it's like, then why even, why even bother? Why even introduce these f- elements if all you're going to do is just toss them aside and he doesn't actually learn anything from it? No, it's so strange. It's such a strange, strange fucking thing. But it's like. As a like, I'm trying to put myself in the position as as the screenwriter. So you have the little foot shoots him in the face, mm-hmm. and that glitches him out. And you could maybe throw in the fade to remember his son and family, but the directive choice to be like, and now we're actually going to cut to his son and his family. Boy, that's on the nose. Yeah, I mean, like it would have been nice to have the subtext of, oh, it reminds him of his son, but to directly then the pivot and now his family. Yeah, it's like okay, this really is like the consumer version of RoboCop. Yeah, exactly. And speaking of other scriptwriter, you know, Frank Miller gets a story by. He also gets a co screenwriting credit. The other one is uh, is it Wal- it's Wallen Green who wrote The Wild Bunch for <laughs> Sam Peckinpah. So the wild, talk about Squid Kings, you know, The Wild Bunch and. The Empire Strikes Back. It's just like, if you'd put those two things together, I would have assumed you do get a great RoboCop sequel. And you know, that there, like I said, there is moments in this movie that I would put up, moments, I'm not saying that, obviously the whole thing, but like there's moments of this movie, I swear to God, I, I could put up against certain scenes in the first RoboCop and say that that's better in RoboCop 2. Like there's some moments for me, like... Um, uh, some of the movement of the shootouts that mm-hmm. that, P- that Peter Weller does. Um, I like the intro, like it, how they introduced RoboCop in this one, just so fucking over the top. Like as a as a like, you know, I would have been four when this came out, but yeah. like as a uh, like a let's say eight, nine, ten year old. This if you're playing action figures, mm-hmm. this is how you introduce RoboCop by having your cars explode, flip over, and they go, oh, RoboCop's dead. He explode him, and he comes out, and he fucking destroys all the bad guys. So we are, so this is where the franchise talk is going to start to transition, where you can tell the filmmakers were prepping the audience for a merchandising turn. Like, one of the bad guys, one of the main henchmen is under 13. Like, yeah. it's Littlefoot from Land Before Time. Like, they're not quite there yet, because, you know, you, I'm not going to see, like, kids aren't, I don't think... Because, like, the, the design of RoboCop 2, like, the actual design right. of the monster, the quote unquote, RoboCop 2, the Kane monster, is terrible. Like, and again, like, it's so blocky. Pretty and awful. It's, it's like, it makes no sense it's that that would be. It's a rock'em, sock'em robot. Yeah. So, you know, but I think it's, it's, they're starting to think that. You know what I mean? Because you get RoboCop on a motorcycle. You know, a lot of things like wouldn't this be cool as a toy? Yeah, exactly. Um, RoboCop holding a giant gun. Yeah, ex- yeah exactly. So, yeah, you definitely see that there. Um, but uh, so, yeah, we get the, the family aspect. Bing, bang, boom. Gone. Just done with. And then the um, and correct me if, if, if you think there's there's a, there's a one before this. But for me, the real second big kind of whiff moment that is it's so weird that it's even in there because it's like just a couple minutes is the reprogramming of RoboCop. Yeah, so, okay, we, I'm going to jump over the first Kane confrontation okay. because it's almost pointless. Like, there's, <laughs> there's a, they expose him, they mess with him, and they cut him up. And they leave him, and you think, sure, like, yeah. oh, this is, like, uh, the second execution of Murphy. Murphy's getting the from the first movie when they totally decimate him. This is going to have a huge impact on him. Mm-hmm. What it ends up doing is they just hang his torso with rope in this really disturbing and cold, uncaring way. And 
in my opinion, this is like when James Bond films have like that social commentary pointed looking at the screen. And now we're going to take this social topic on moment. Uh, this was like <laughs> RoboCop is going to address the idea of therapy and focus groups. And oh, well, they, yeah, they even have the moment where they're all sitting there and they're like, we would like it if he, um, what was it? Like, uh, said, talk this out more. Yeah, he didn't, didn't use that big gun all the time. didn't use that big gun. Well, I could see that being like literally parents watching Robo, like they're like, they saw Robocop right. for the first time. They're like, why doesn't he use a gun? Why can't he be, involved? and all of that becomes Robocop 3. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and, and even in this, they they say and like as a child I would have assumed oh yeah RoboCop's just acting insane because of bad programming but now mm-hmm. as a full grown adult it's like this is a straight up commentary on the idea of focus groups and perhaps what focus groups do to tainting filmmaking maybe from Irvin Kershner like mm-hmm. maybe that was his bit of commentary I can't say for sure but it was so pointed and in the end what's well, when he so- works he works on you know he makes arguably the greatest Star Wars movie talking about like messing with your your saga and your franchise yeah. you know unfortunately so much of star wars has that's become so much of star wars you know with with what they did with all the, the gazillion different cuts and all that kind of stuff you know and it's still it just the whole sequence of him being reprogrammed incorrectly it could have led to like high stakes mm-hmm. they could have he could have put like his partner in in danger or gotten some cops killed yeah, like the, damn oh, robocop yeah, totally. you messed yeah, up yeah like that's a good point like it, it never there's no consequence of it there's like no it's stakes. just it's just like yeah, Lewis is just, like, annoyed. Yeah, and he has, like, this weird, like, let's talk about our feelings. Oh, How many times yeah. does Robocop say that in that Well, he's movie? like, he's like, you know, it's like, waste makes haste. And then he's just like, in a bad language makes bad feelings, you know? And like, Let's talk about look, our feelings. It's goofy, and it's like, if you're just watching it, like, as a scene, it's, it's funny, like, you know, because it's like, you know, Peter Weller, and he's playing this very, like, Shakespearean grandiose with, his, right. with the way he moves, and supposedly the him shooting the, 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 outline around the guy's head when he's smoking was used as non-smoking ads you know like in movie theaters and stuff it was like a 15 second non-smoking commercial exactly so but but and you know uh, on on the other giga show we always make fun of the scene and we love to quote the scene where he's like isn't the moon lovely and she's like it's daylight and he's like it's the thought that counts she's like oh jesus we're going back to the station like but like you're saying like oh my god could you imagine if like yeah like a cop got killed or, or or seriously injured or like he improperly acted in a scenario where it was like what the fuck robocop mm-hmm. like this we really messed you up. Like, they could have made a point with that. Like, you focus group something so much that it loses all oomph and all effectiveness. To, to have that happen to a police officer would be terrifying. Yeah. But and what they the, you know, lose the, that completely. And, the, and like, we know, the, we, you know, the for all first movies, cops don't go on strike. Cops aren't going to go on strike. They're on strike on this movie. Like, right immediately. Right away. And, but, you know, like you're saying, this is such an interesting point, you know, like you're bringing up, like, like what if the cops go on strike because RoboCop is jeopardizing their lives yeah. as going out there. You know, then it gives you a reason. Yeah, Not it, just we start the movie, they're on strike. And this is a question I had the entire film. I don't know how many times I asked it. Why is anybody doing any of this? <laughs> yeah. What is Kane's motivation? What is Omnicorp's motivation other than to just buy and own Detroit? Outside of that, why are they like evil geniuses and doing all this hurtful shit? None of it really makes any sense other than to set up just like cool... RoboCop moments that kind of maybe yeah, don't go anywhere. And like, and like I said, like for me, it's a series of cool moments that I like, yeah. and 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 moments that I think are that showcase some of Peter Weller's best, some of his best moments in the suit. Um, <clears throat> jumping around a bit, uh, the kid when the, when the the gangster kid, little his name, yeah, when he when he dies in the movie, um, I think it's a really it's it's so the whole scene's fucking nuts, but I think it's a beautiful moment where that's why you that's why you cast Peter Weller and that's why you miss Peter Weller the moment where he plays consoling this like asshole kid yeah like this dying. kid has murdered a lot and of he, people you know tried to kill Robocop he's, he's strung killed out the cops. women yeah you know what I mean and even then he's treating this child like lovingly and even he has, though he doesn't have to and he has such a nice moment where he's like he's so quiet with his delivery mm-hmm. you know just little moments like that I think again I search for so many of those moments in this movie because there are stretches where, like, we were joking, like, remember this is a RoboCop movie? Dude, there is a legitimate discussion about corporatization of urban centers mm-hmm. and the, like, you want to talk about, like, all the socialist talk I was doing in the last episode. This film is, like, a perfect mirror of what actually happened to the city of Detroit 
and they whiff it so hard, and it goes on for way too long. There's the there's the board meeting, there's the focus group meeting, and then there's like the weird clandestine mayor meeting with the little gangster boy who's essentially buying the city in that moment. Yeah, and it's all about like, well. You know, the government couldn't handle it. You know, why not just let the corporations get in a bidding war over who controls the city? What does it really fucking matter anyway? Wow, that feels way too familiar to real life. (laughs) Yeah, and I don't know. It just, um, it's just the whole movie is just like, just, I don't know, whiff after whiff with like, with ideas um, and. uh, And a much nicer suit. Uh, a suit. higher quality of film resolution. It, yes, it gets all the things that sequels get, which is more money. You yeah, know? Um, that's. Let's talk about that, right? There's okay. so many similarities between RoboCop Two and a lot of the great sequels of its generation. Sure. Like the first thing I pointed out was the Lethal Weapon Two style intro, where mm-hmm. you're just jumping in, and RoboCop isn't the first person to appear on screen, but he sure is the guy that comes in and saves the day immediately. Yeah, we are thrown into. The Detroit that we are seeing in the first RoboCop. You on know what a, I mean? A lot on more a grand, neon. A lot more neon. And it has kind of this really, it, uh, it's not one shot, but this kind of tracking shot that goes down. And you just see like every person you meet gets mugged by the next person. Yep. Um, and then we're, it is literally exclamation point with the explosion of a pawn store, gun store, and then people just unloading their shit. One of which was robbed by like, the bad news bears. <laughs> oh yeah, later on, yeah. <laughs> like Walter Matthau robs a store. Later on, they do that. Yeah, where RoboCop and 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 Lewis go in there, and she's like, "Where are they?" And, he and the guy's like, "What do you mean? They're still here. The little <laughs> bastards are still here." Um, but yeah, so it it's bigger. You know, bigger doesn't always mean better, right? So like, you have Alien and then Aliens, where it was like, okay, bigger might actually mean better. T two, wow, James Cameron really stepped up his game. Mm-hmm. RoboCop two is like the obvious like. Not all sequels are going to be great, kids. <laughs> no, I mean it's, and and the, and the sad thing is it never course corrects. You know because no. a perfect example, Indiana Jones trilogy. You get Raiders of the Lost Ark, one of the greatest just action adventure, just pure wonderful films ever made. Mm-hmm. You get Temple of Doom. Some people love it. Like that's my brother's favorite of the trilogy. Technically a prequel. Technically, exactly. Yes, technically a prequel it takes place in thirty five, and you know Raiders is thirty six. But like, um. It it kind of strays a bit from the mm-hmm. formula, you know. They're it's like, "Oh, let's let's, let's let's shake it up," and people were like, "No, <laughs> not not not." It's not, it's not a bad movie. It's definitely not a bad movie, but it 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 shook people up, and so they're like, "Okay, we'll course correct with Last Crusade," um, and so, but unfortunately, as you guys will hear when we get to RoboCop three, that does not happen. It boy, just oh becomes boy. more and more of people like RoboCop, kids like RoboCop, L- and, and and here's the thing too, like. You with RoboCop, I I don't know. This is just me spitballing, but it's like that look of RoboCop. We've talked about it, the sleek, bulky, cool look. It's like is if you just put him on screen, it'll work. It'll sell, and that clearly does not work. Even, you know what I mean? Even in the moments where they build drama, like it was so corny. I actually compared it to Vintage Pro Wrestling Ultimate Warrior in the headlock, where like he's going to sleep, mm-hmm. and then his arm starts to shake and raise, mm, yeah. and the power of the crowd is the thing. That's exactly how they play the uh, the the bad programming moment. And RoboCop does show up in WCW, I think, around the t- promotion of this movie, and to help Sting out to to like you know be like tag team buddies. This is sad. Yeah, <laughs> this well, is and, very and th- sad. This is yeah. This is like you're saying the beginning of RoboCop monetization exactly um and so it takes a lot of it, this is they start taking the teeth away mm-hmm. from mobile cop then how can we make it more accessible yeah and there were there were moments in the movie like i, I keep referencing there's that sh- there's the shootout in this movie later on where like the whole cops descend and robocop's there and he does like those like three or four no look kills mm-hmm. that feel very first robocop because they just go in guns blazing it's inarguably the best action sequence of the film yeah where like the all the directives are gone Mm -hmm. everything's been stripped all like you had the the prime three directives then you had like the weird focus group 500 directives oh yeah and then once he loses all of that he's just like the strike is over let's go fuck all these (laughs) people up i'm pissed at kane and he really does like he's just like no look no look behind the back under the leg yeah and it's it's genuine like oh this is sick this yeah. is so dope yeah yeah I I mean I I am always there for that stuff and and that's something where like even watching like ahead I've been watching some of the prime directives even some like and this is kind of I'm going back on what I said earlier but like there are moments of like if you have RoboCop doing that 
it will help like it'll make the it'll make it just a, like you'll catch that fire a little bit you know what i mean um as long if you can throw that in there um but yeah this movie it, it i think the beginning the the uh, action scene with robo in the beginning is pretty entertaining with uh, him and lewis actually teaming up yeah like saving the baby lewis, with the ricochet and... lewis like really when she has to perform in this film she blows some people yeah. away yeah she's got the shotgun in the end and just fucking <laughs> rocking dudes and like um, but also we were talk- talking about it too at the end of this movie they drop all subtlety with OCP and just have the full on like, Nazi flag colors the transformation of Omnicorp in the first film of like a very Trumpian it's just like, like it's just, it's know, just like, a business it, like you know like you see like right you know, and executives who are so ruthless they'll watch their cohorts die in the room and be like that loser yeah like that was a good commentary yeah the guy gets blown away he's good I get the promotion yeah now, now I got the promotion now like that was like oh wow this is like a little take on corporate life of the 80s and then in 1990 Irvin Kirshner was like but what if they just looked exactly <laughs> like Nazis though yeah it, like we were saying like it loses any subtlety and interest when you just put the OCP logo in the red flag draped it's over the building with Nazi the flag. white yeah with the white circle on it and then you redo all like I don't I don't think they're police officers but the like, OCP <laughs> no. security in just like, wearing the all leather black leather lapeled military only thing missing coats. was the uh, the armband yeah the red that said bands. OCP oh, yeah man. I mean like th- th- even then they were probably like that's a little too much you right know what I mean? and even in the moment where they're like this is too much the Nazis and the journalists were the only people that that died and that was like mm. Boy, they were also the only people is, allowed in. Really, it's like this is a strange, yeah. strange sequence of events. <laughs> the final, the final fight between. Ro- and seriously, I have to just ask this until the show is over. Could they not think of a better name than RoboCop Two as the villain? Yeah, they were like in RoboCop Two. RoboCop's gonna fight RoboCop, RoboCop 2. Two. That must have been them being like, "That's something they would have done in real RoboCop land." You know, in real <laughs> RoboCop world. Paul Verhoeven would like. Yeah, this. he would love this shit. This is so And he's meta. too busy making a much better movie called Total Recall. <laughs> no, it'll never do good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, the end. So about the end of the movie. All right. First of all, before we get into the RoboCop 2 guy, <laughs> Kane <laughs> is a good villain. Kane is like, I don't understand his motivation, but the guy they cast, who is the the villain in Last Action yep. Hero, who's the creepy dude who steals one episode of Louie, mm. uh, he's like always like the cold, behind-the-eyes killer guy. And he follows the RoboCop villain checklist pretty well. Yeah. Just goes for it. Yeah, no, like, if you look at Red from yeah. that 70s <laughs> yeah. show and, like, a follow-up to him, yeah. that's a perfect companion. They were both, like, balding white guys with a psychotic side. Now, granted, Kane is, he, I remember when they first introduced him, you were like, oh, I get it, cocaine. Cocaine. <laughs> but they, he, he is a little more subdued, but he's no less crazy and yeah. insane. Yeah, on the religious front. Yes, yes. And, and, and when I was reading the, the definitive history book here that we're, that we've been talking about, he talked about uh, the actor who plays Kane was talking about how he's originally, I think, supposed to wear like a priest outfit. He's very, very, he very pastoral. Jesus. Yeah, and he mentions Jesus when they're like literally, you know, ripping apart Robo again, yeah. you know, piece by piece. Um, it's it, he's not a bad actor. He didn't make bad choices for the villain, and it is all ruined and all undone when that fucking lawnmower man oh, face Jesus comes up on that Christ. tablet thing. I was like, what are we doing yeah. in this movie? Oof. Like, if it was a villain and they just called it like C.A.I.N, <laughs> like, this is an improvement on yeah, what we yeah. ended up with. What, what, okay, let's, let's, let's put ourselves on the spot. What could we do to make it like Kane be the thing? Like, calculating, assassinating. Oh, okay, let's do that. Like, computer, com- yeah, computer assisted, assisted. Uh, Intellectual, uh, uh, I got, I'm, and, and is tricky and is, um, and is hard. Uh, shit. Neuro something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Computer <laughs> assisted inter Face. intellectual, uh, neuro programming. Guys, if you have a better acronym <laughs> for Kane, please send it in. Well, what he really would be would be like calculating, assassinating, um, uh, Isolated, isolated, um, 
<laughs> Nectoplasm. N is very difficult. Yeah, it is really difficult. <laughs> anyway, but so any, but even then they could have come up with anything. But it yeah, Robocop 2. And you know what? Bad. Every time I mention Robocop 2 to somebody, one of the first things they'll always say if they saw the movie, of course, is, oh, that's the one where the bad guy's name is Robocop 2. <laughs> it's bad Company off this album, Bad Company by the band Bad Company. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the end of the movie, I, I, I had talked about this last time. I love that the last line of this movie is we're only human in like a whole movie where this guy has just been fucked with left and right. And it's such a little tongue in cheek robo Told line. Told over and over. You're just a machine. You're not Alex Murphy. You're not a man. And he still gets that one. And and he's he's saying it as he's like undoing his, his face head. helmet. You think you're going to get one final look at his face. Yeah. It's just like, no, I'm just like scratching my face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you definitely don't get as much um scary ball sack face robo in this one the performance well, actually, for, for you real, get though is you, weird you actually only get him in that makeup for one scene yeah. because the rest of it is the s actually i think it's pretty good um stop that's not motion but like uh actual like special effect mm-hmm. uh i'm drawing blanking on the fucking special effect term but when he's like ripped apart yeah they have like his face all like you know you know done and it looks pretty good still um, and then they, you were saying how they just get away with having to do it by putting the helmet on his head without the visor. So you it see was his eye. like I'm convinced that was a reshoot. Like we have to give, <laughs> yes, we have to probably. give this psychologist character. Who, by the way, psychology is also a villain in this film. It's mm. very important to point that out. And it's a little Scientologist, mm-hmm. and it kind of bugged me out. But like, she didn't really have that much motivation, and they had to have this one scene where the, she's like, I know, I'll just tell you to do anything, and then you'll do it. This is exactly what psychology is. Yeah. And when that scene is happening, Peter Weller, as RoboCop, is laying there like, yes, what you're saying, I am thinking. But he has <laughs> no makeup on. He doesn't look like he's attached also, as a robot or any of that stuff. I'm convinced, Mike, that he's not even in the suit. That he is sitting under a chair, oh, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, and the helmet's just over his the eyes. Helmet's just over his eyes. Oh my god, that's exactly what happened. It's because like, if it at was an a reshoot, he'd probably be like, "I'm not fucking." Don't put me in that don't fucking put me makeup. In this shit. <laughs> that's four hours. It's so it's so weird though because like, okay, is the vi because that makes me believe, and this may be obvious to everybody else listening. I always assumed that the visor he had on was what he was seeing all that shit pop up. Mm-hmm. But if that's the case, he has like cybernetic eyes, right? Because there's no visor, and he's and, there, and right oh before that. Oh my god! And he is seeing right the before computer that he's seeing view. the computer. Okay, now I'm really. What is the visor for? <laughs> because that that kind of actually that kind of messes with. Well, no, that's not true. Because no, it, it makes sense. It makes sense now. Because in the first one, remember, he takes it off and he's trying to target, and he can't. So that makes sense. But like, he totally has cybernetic eyes. Yeah. What is the point of the visor then, or the helmet at all? <laughs> well, I guess to not get shot in the head it's, again. It's still very confusing if it's a, like a robot skull. Also, did the, face. did the is the visor something that he could always pop up? Like, <laughs> or does he always have to have that Allen wrench handy to get that yeah. thing off? Like, it's just always in his gun holster. Yeah, I have yeah, like this. Film like, has... could you imagine he like he's leaving with Lewis? Like when the, you know he's leaving the police station and he turns around, he's like, I have to go back. Uh, and I she's like, Why? Well, I, I forgot. I forgot my Allen wrench. I forgot the Allen wrench. I'm not gonna get stuck. And he walks. He walks around the police station without his without his helmet on. Remember that one scene? Like, I'm not on. He's like probably like I'm not on duty. Fuck it. There and and you like in the film when they got on his case about visiting his wife and causing psychological damage. Mm-hmm. I was thinking there has to be at least one police officer who complains every time Murphy walks around without his mask on like I am having nightmares about this I know I sound like I'm being funny but I'm yeah. not look I just got off a triple shift I saw some fucked up shit and out there and then I see this guy's la- face yeah and I turn and I see just a stretch stretch ball sack face Ugh. and it's the last thing I want to see as I'm clocking look, I'm out I'm gonna sue the department okay yeah. like that's the person that organized the strike <laughs> he's like and they're actually striking because they saw Robocop's just ball really sack annoyed. face and then so when they throw his ripped apart body out, out on, on the this curb is this is it the one person who looks down and see it first is the one who started it's just like oh fuck there it is again i can't escape the horror of this face yeah and the police strike like every other thread in this film is just suddenly resolved it's just suddenly resolved everybody's good again and the cops no one's mad at the cops for all the crime they allowed to happen yeah like no consequences at all yeah for it's like lewis and lewis robocop and you said what, F- Sean Astin's? Uh, Sean Astin's mean older brother. Mean older brother. The dirty are the cop. only three cops, 
going around Detroit that were actually doing a job mm -hmm. or <laughs> their job. The one dirty cop was just going around getting paid, doing hits for people, like a lot of money, actually. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> who was a junkie, by the way. Like, yeah. And by the way, before this episode, Nuke is just an analogy for the crack epidemic of the 90s, right? Like, it had it, one yeah, syllable, so. easily... I mean, like, it, the first thing that I thought of when I saw Nuke was the the G.I. Joe takes on narcotics mm. storyline they had in the 90s. What's, like, what would be, like, crack is whack? What would be the Nuke thing? Nuke is puke. Nuke is puke. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> or Nuke. Nuke is Duke. Yeah. That ain't, that, don't touch that shit. Nuke That's Duke. is Duke. Yeah. No, I'm, that... still, I'm still trying to think of, like, the officer who's, like, running around going, like, I can't. I, I get off my ship and see this fucking ball sack man face. I have a feeling it'd be, like, one of Lewis's friends. And she'd be like, she'd be like, you gotta fucking tell your fucking goddamn. You have got to tell your partner to keep his goddamn. Like they're like on. they're they're like they're you know well it, you know it doesn't really matter because they have co-ed locker rooms and they, <laughs> still, you know what I mean. But like still. one of Lewis's like friends is like from the academy. She's just like you got to tell your fucking partner to put his goddamn helmet it's on. Giving me nightmares. The last thing I want to see is this old ball sack face walking around. It's just giving me nightmares. Yeah, I can't sleep, and when I close my eyes, I see that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, this is the and they're doing the um, they're doing like the weekly like you know checking out. They're like, okay, Robo, please um, we have an anonymous tip. Please keep your goddamn helmet on. We have an anonymous tip in Carol's handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> Carol's handwriting. And then like oh, she's like man. uneasy in the chair because she's like, hey, Robo. He's like, hello, Carol. Hello, Carol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see that report. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, he, he though even better. He grabs the fucking thing and he can analyze the handwriting. He analyzes the he's handwriting. Like, he's like, Carol, can you write your name down? And she writes it down and he picks it up and he's just like, Carol, you bitch. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it, you snitch ass, Carol. <laughs> Uh, this is better than the actual He gets film. so fucking pissed about Carol complaining that he keeps his helmet off. Like this, it really would have been better as an 80s style comedy. Just like a straight up comedy mm -hmm. comedy. Yeah. But it's it just, I don't know. I It was such a downer that I found myself doing shit like this. Like instead of being engaged. We definitely joked the themes, way more during yeah, this movie. Yeah, for sure. Like we were mystery science theatering this movie like crazy as opposed to like there were long stretches of watching RoboCop, the first one, where we were just silent. Yeah, we were like, just engaged watching it. Like, wow, this is beautiful. The shots are amazing. The violence is like... Out of control. Out of control and kind of stomach turning. And there's really not like... And I, don't, I know some people aren't looking for this, but there's really not like ultra violence in this. Like, there's like squibs and people being shot, but there's no... Yeah. And like, what was what would the, you say is the scene in this movie that you would call back to? Like, oh, this is the, the RoboCop 2 scene. Like... You know what I mean? Like the all right. So if I look at the first film, it's either the warehouse gunfight or the execution. Of course. And this man, you're. It is. Carol complaining about RoboCop's <laughs> ball sack. It's gotta. It's gotta be when they lose the directives and something actually gets done. Like all the cops join forces to wreck shit with RoboCop. Uh, even Lewis takes a bunch that, of people out. That could have been a much more like rousing scene though you know what i mean like yeah. it could have been a much more like the good guys are now going up to kick ass and it's as instead it's just kind of like going after kane i'm pissed and then like yeah. cut to boom boom bing, bang, 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 and, and kane then... essentially does all the stuff that robocop should have done at the end which is you pointed that out like robocop 2 just takes everybody out yeah and it's that that scene should have been like the monster wakes up and kills everybody they thought that it could trust or they thought it could trust it and instead it's just like oh yeah no literally every character on screen can be taken out and i wouldn't mind yeah and it just leads to robocop fighting robocop 2 exactly like iron man fights obadiah stain in iron man 1 or what if that's true but what if what if that scene goes down and robocop saves the kid because like even yeah. though this kid is a piece of shit that is the only like that kid to him might as well be his kid, dude. You know and what if, I mean? if you do save the kid at screenwriter time, you save the badass killer kid, convert him, and now he's like killer kid on your side of the team for the third film. Mm -hmm. That'd be amazing. Yeah. But instead, he dies yeah. in a weird pile of cash. Yeah. 
and he's just like, like his, his final line was <laughs> you've died before so you know what this like it really sucks yeah <laughs> he and dies. dies he fucking dies that's his last line yeah it really sucks yeah and so does this movie kind of <laughs> so I, I i wouldn't flat out say this movie sucks i i still have a bit of um I wouldn't even call it nostalgia because I didn't grow up watching yeah, RoboCop too. For sure, but there's is a it, thank God for Peter Weller. There's a, there's some interesting stuff in there. There's some moments like we've talked about that I think are okay. But it's not a movie that I can see me jumping down and sitting down and watching all the way through and not skipping some stuff. It's certainly not part of a franchise where if if I was like showing my friends like oh you got to see Predator One and Predator Two. Yeah. they're both legit. Yeah. This is I wouldn't break this out. This is this like is, guys sit down for an hour and fifty five minutes and maybe enjoy forty. Unless unless somebody was like, unless somebody was like, I watched the first Robocop. That was fucking amazing. I have to know. Like you know, they gets really into it. You exactly. be like, All right, look, well, now's where here, I have to give you the news. Here's what Robocop two is like. It could have been this other thing. It could have been God knows what. You know, I don't know. Like you know that yeah. This is not one you're gonna be like. Here's Robocop one and two. And three, you go, here's RoboCop. In my mind as a kid, I always thought like Rambo, RoboCop, Predator, Alien, Terminator, these were all franchises that were just indisputably awesome. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the individual chapters of some of those franchises, eh, not so much. Well, this is one that like, I wouldn't be shocked if I talked to some people about RoboCop and I talked to everyone I've ever met in my entire life Mm -hmm. about RoboCop. Like I'm going boarding a plane and I'm like, RoboCop? And she's like, here's your ticket, sir. I'm like, RoboCop? You've seen RoboCop? <laughs> um, uh, they, some people probably have no idea they're sequels. Yeah, that's a real. Some good people point. probably don't even realize there was an original RoboCop that wasn't Joel Kinnaman. Yeah, what, Samuel L. Jackson's not in the film? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, I think some people, and like I said, that's, I don't, you know, I don't really care, but like, this is RoboCop is iconic for RoboCop 1987's RoboCop. Mm-hmm. It's not like you said. And granted, Aliens goes off the rail. The Alien franchise. I love yeah, the first two, yeah. of course. Terminator definitely goes off the rail. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Although I for some reason I watch the Terminator movies in general all of those ones mm-hmm. way more than I've watched the Alien ones. Without a doubt. Like there's, something... there's still stuff in T3. Um Salvation, we talked about the last time oddly enough. I, I think I've seen that once, actually. Yeah. And that's actually one that we always talked about, like, what's worse, three or salvation. Mm-hmm. And I always gave salvation a bit of an edge in the pro column because mm-hmm. it tried something different at least. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And the, this has become a cyborg podcast now. And, and, and yeah, it's like a 90s power franchise discussion now because like yeah. there there is a lot of holes in everybody's game. But I think with a franchise like Terminator Skynet, is so strong like every you know everybody's cool with watching humans fight the robot overlords with like with the robocop franchise they should have leaned a little harder into the pure evil of omnicorp and helped us understand why exactly we should hate these people or mistrust them like an alien yeah like you knew the whole time the corporation was to, to be questioned of course you know and and in this it's like I mean, you know they're the bad guys, but at the same time, they just don't sell that at all. Mm-hmm. Even when they hire this weird, mad scientist, psychologist woman, like, why is she on their <laughs> payroll? Where did this come from? She is the uh, scapegoat in the end, though. That's for sure. Oh, yeah, they really set her up so hard. And, the, and what's his face? Old man is like, that works. That's that worked always before. Just scapegoat. It's like the writing at the end is like, yep, that'll work. That'll be just fine. That'll be just fine. Go ahead and order one of those, Jeffrey. <laughs> and that's how it ends. So, final. I, I want to do final thoughts on RoboCop too, because there's actually RoboCop in the news we want to touch on before All right. we end this. All right. So, any final thoughts on RoboCop two? Final thoughts on RoboCop two are sequels often have diminishing returns. That is my main takeaway from this, and that. Someone along the process of writing the sequel got the themes that Paul Verhoeven was going for, but instead of continuing subverting these things, they were just like, what if we talked about all these ideas out loud the entire time? Yeah. And that doesn't work. Is your favorite part of RoboCop 2 that the, sh- the suit looks a little nicer? <laughs> the, honestly, <laughs> it looks... Because you were. You were like, you were all, like every so often you're like, that's a nice looking suit, yeah, man. It just looked better on screen. I bought that it was a robot guy. I, everything looked... The, the, I think the budget for the effects department was like 
that's if I had to really like give everybody a big thumbs up, it's you know the special effects, except for the CGI stuff. <laughs> poor Kane. Oh yeah, Jesus. That poor lawnmower man, stuck in that poor machine. But yeah, I I, I definitely think the stop motion animation, the 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 RoboCop two versus RoboCop fighting, all that stuff, it still looks great. You yeah, know what no, I mean? it does. Like all it of does. the 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 eye of RoboCop was still there. Like mm-hmm. the visual aesthetic that made everything pleasing if the the volume was muted. Yeah. I could do it. The light hasn't been extinguished entirely yet right. from RoboCop. Right. Yeah, the there's ideas st- like, were there's still, still there. Like I said, if you are a big fan of... like If you're listening to this for real, and like and because like I said, I did not grow up watching 2 and 3. Not at all. If you're a, if you're listening to this right now and you've watched the first RoboCop, you love the first RoboCop, I, I, I would not say, you know, knock all three out because three is tough. It's got, you know, we'll, that's a whole other episode we get into. But I think you could watch 2. And still get something out of it. Yeah. And enjoy parts of it. Yeah, and still see something like a commentary. Sure. You could still see elements of flashes of what made 1987 God's favorite movie mm-hmm. and the perfect movie that is RoboCop. Um, so real quick before we wrap this thing up, Mike, as it always happens when I ever do one of these podcasts, I was doing a Kiss podcast and like as I finished one of the episodes, like... Gene and Ace Fraley were like, "Hey, we're gonna start writing together, hanging out, and do so." I was like, "Oh, come on, man! We're gonna and I have start like, writing together." Yeah, months in between, you know, episode or whatever. Um, there's been news that they are in the very, very, very early stages of writing a direct sequel to 1987's RoboCop mm, with 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 original writer Edward Newmyer. So, um. That's interesting. They're gonna, it's going to do what the new Terminator is going to do. It's kind of only the first two exist, mm-hmm. and then we'll finish the trilogy. This movie we just watched would no longer be canon in RoboCop. You know, the the reboot definitely would not be re- canon. And it literally, I think we had just recorded the episode and posted, I think, the first episode, or about to post it. And one of my buddies, it might have been Chris from Geek Out, sent me a thing and was like, dude, they're making a, a new RoboCop. Holy fucking shit. It's... I'm more excited by the prospect of a redo uh, than I I am with just about any franchise because you can see where a redo if if they totally know what they're going for. Mm-hmm. That's exciting. You know, I was I was totally on board with the idea of because I don't think the reboot was a was not I don't wouldn't call it a flop. It made money. Yeah, no. It it and I was excited when mm-hmm. it came out to see if it was I mean like people actually were interested to see if it was good or not. Yeah, and it wasn't like, you know, I've I've talked about it before like, you know, how it's for me unfortunately every time I watch that like a little less. Mm-hmm. Um but it, it it wasn't like a critically destroy you know no de- you know it it was like kind of just in the middle like some... it didn't like it didn't get roasted on how did this get made or we hate movies mm-hmm. or any of like the flop house any of the like the terrible movie podcast didn't really make the road how did this get made ever done robocop 3 no interesting yeah no as far as i understand they've pretty much steered clear away from these robocop 3 franchises. when we watch robocop 3 mike because have you ever seen robocop 3 i've seen the jokes taken out of context okay. in like youtube so clips. you will yeah because I, I i love how this get made but i know you're like a massive fan and like seen them live and mm-hmm. stuff like you will see how this is a be a perfect how to this i'm ready movie. for it um but anyway so that's something we're going to keep our, our our finger on the pulse for the uh any developing news of this this upcoming robocop movie which is kind of really exciting and i'm excited because like it's one of the original uh you know co-writers of the movie mm-hmm. uh screenplay credit and it's um it's a sequel to the one that started it all like yeah. i don't know what that means because like even i don't either even the uh the article there's like basically that was it we are in the process of creating this and thing verhoven's still around oh yeah yeah so he could at least be a consulting producer oh, okay. and and i he is but he hasn't made an american film since hollow man okay I'm, that was the movie that kind of ran him out but could you imagine oh my god i can't imagine paul verhoven coming back to make this yes i can oh, absolutely and it if, if anything was going to woo him back it would be that it'd have to be robo it had to be RoboCop. And his utter disdain for remakes. Oh, and nowadays though, like like you were saying, like we watched a movie made in 1987 in a 2017 2018 world, and we're like, mm-hmm. holy shit! Mm-hmm. What would how much fun would Paul Verhoeven have? Doing now that? you're thinking. And like I said, you know, you know, um, Edward Neumeyer, like hasn't he he worked with him on Star? He worked with Paul Verhoeven on Starship Troopers, and he directed one of them too. I think at least one of them. Um, he did not touch any of the other RoboCop movies. 
So this could be a really interesting thing. Um, I'm excited, man. Like I, I honestly, when when the reboot came out and kind of came and went, like it was yeah. kind of obvious that unfortunately, I, I would have been down for a sequel because the end is very much like they put a badge on him and the, it, he's back in his silver and now he's going out and everyone's like, oh, it's Robo with like cell phone footage and stuff. Um, I was like, I was like, please, that'd be great because I wanted there to be more RoboCop. But when I realized, you know, how Hollywood works and money talks and all that kind of stuff, oh, that's probably it for the Joel Kinnaman mm-hmm. era. I was like, well, that's probably it for RoboCop for a while. You know what I mean? At like they're not going to jump. Years. Yeah, they're not going to jump back into it. It's only been four years, right? Has it been four years? Yeah, I guess 2014. Yeah. Um, you know, but last year was what the 30th anniversary of RoboCop. Um, and he's know, still got people. When I'm buying like Funko products, there's tons of RoboCop. There they have a Funko Pop Mini, they have a Funko Pop Regular, uh, yeah, oh, sure they yeah. have a plushie. I mean, like people's the it's like you said before, the imagery and the character design of RoboCop is so like yeah, of course I like this. That like, kids, is like one of the most endearing this. things. It's funny to say endearing about this ultra violent satire, but like one of the most endearing things about Robocop is that is like look, I mean like I know you can't you guys can't see, it, but the cover of that. I mean like just, just show that to anybody, even if a kid doesn't know who Robocop is. Anyone who's seen the film knows the image of Robocop getting out of his car ready to fuck shit up. Yeah, and that's the great thing about the beginning of this movie is he they basically recreates this scene. He just gets out as his car's on fire to fuck shit up. Yeah. But you show this to like a, a 5 or 6 year old, it's like tell me everything. Yeah, you show this to a 5 or 6 year old, they're going to love the I mean they that's everything they they want to see right I don't there. know his story, I just know that this guy is yeah. Cool. And then, you know, on the back, you know, I, I, it took me a while to get into the, the reboot outfit. I still am not totally sold in the black. Like, I am a little more than when I first saw it. I still like the silver, but there's a huge, you know, there's a huge difference. I mean, they, you know, you, they, 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 that original look and the, the idea that Robo would exist again in modern day, like, and, and it's like- exciting as hell to me. And the first film got a lot of the technological and societal stuff cynically very correct. It would be interesting to see what he would get right now for what you know is to come in thirty years. So, I think that's. I mean, look what happened with Mad Max. You know, great example too because there was that amount of time between the the creative. Mm-hmm. Stepping into the franchise, and that should be something that like get Paul Verhoeven. Like you're sitting down, he's like, I don't know, you know, I've, I've the last American movie I made didn't blah blah blah. They're like, yeah, George Miller, George Miller though. They're like George Miller, and they'd be like, if I was in charge of like anything to do with this, and Paul Verhoeven even sat down in the same room to say no to me, I'd be like, you can do whatever you want. We're giving you the George Miller contract with this. Yeah, you know, you got one of the OG writers on this. Let's let's run with it. And just don't film it in black and white. That's all we or, ask. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or at least, like you said, get him on as executive producer. Get his get him there on set, guiding somebody. Yeah, you I, know, because I think he, I I would like to think that he'd be totally. I'm like putting words in his mouth. I would like to think that he'd be like all about shadowing somebody to be the next Paul Ver. You know what I mean? Like Paul Ver that makes their their, yeah. their statement. Yeah. Get someone like young and hungry to like really go fucking hard because something about that 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 the first RoboCop does so well that the second, the third, and all the follow up stuff doesn't do is they oh. go fucking hard in that eighty seven RoboCop. I just RoboCop. had the craziest idea: hmm. Paul Verhoeven consulting Neville Dean and Taylor, the directors of Crank and Crank Two. Oh, let oh let them go! Like, I, dude, I just love let the Crank them, fucking movies. Let man. those two degenerates under the guidance of Paul Verhoeven. That would be a that'd be totally a, go ape shit on RoboCop. Oh my god, I would be so into that. Are you saying that Jason Statham's going to be a RoboCop? <laughs> oh man, I'd also be into that. <laughs> he's but already he's, bald. <laughs> he's a little too short, but I'm into it. Yeah, because you know they're going to re- you know you know they. Pretty Yo. much have to cast, recast. Okay. Uh, That's my official fan cast. Okay. I'm Wizard Magazine 92. Okay. Is, is, is Jason Statham? Uh, directed by Neville Dean and Taylor with their Hoven on set consultant. Yeah. 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 That's my final answer. I dig it. You know who else I would really like to, I think would be a good Robocop? Joel Edgerton. Yeah. Perfect choice. I like, Joel him, I like him a lot. Yeah. Or the guy from um, Avatar. Uh, oh yeah, they, uh, Sam Worthington, Jake Sully. <laughs> yes, J- Sam Worthington. Well, you got to have that chin. You yeah. got to have that. You got to have Murphy's jaw. jaw. <laughs> and on that, folks, uh, I'm Jake. I'm Mike. Uh, stick around for more uh, RoboCop fun in a month. We'll be doing RoboCop three. Oh no! Uh, remember, kids, stay out of trouble and talk about your feelings. This has been another Geek Out production. If you enjoyed what you heard, hey, you know, we've got a special episode every Friday. Of course, there's the usual catching up show every Wednesday. And you get book club episodes just about every Tuesday these days. Thanks for listening.